Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. All right. All right. Welcome everyone to Hebrew Institute Live. This is our Sabbath before Pesach. And I'm so looking forward. I know three people who are going to be on their way down tomorrow. Yay! <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And trust me when I say I have been around here like, ur, ur, ur. you see that Tasmanian devil? That's how this house has been trying to get everything uh, uh, wrapped up. And Brad, I'm going to need you to call me um, after service so I can see how we're going to do these uh, uh, TVs and everything like that. I'm so excited. I'm excited about, you know, everybody coming down. I'm excited about this Pesach and everything. Um, I have to apologize to those who will not be here. I have to send you some honey and some other things. Everybody is leaving with gifts, okay, this year. Some sort of gifts and gifting, okay, this year. So I will have to be making some runs, okay, and uh, some runs to the post office, some runs to houses and everything so that uh, everyone can get their gifts of honey and uh, the Seder plate that, we, that I have. And I found, let me tell you what I found. I found these certificates. You remember the certificates to our tree? Okay, our olive tree. Okay, so I found uh, that certificate. But I also found uh, the year. There was one year where on the back of it, I also purchased trees for Hebrew Institute in Israel. And I found that certificate also. So I'm giving everybody a copy of that original Okay, that original uh, 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 tree, as well as the certificate of our trees in Israel also. So uh, uh, I'm just so, you know, I praise God. I praise God, you know, for everything that he is doing. And this Torah portion is very, very personal to me. This, I tell you, well, okay, this particular year, after what happened to me on... Third, what was, yes, it had to be on Thursday. What happened to me on Thursday? I had a near death experience, a near death experience. And let me tell you what happened. All right. I went to this restaurant to pick something up. There was a homeless woman there who came up to me and asked me to purchase her a soda, which of course, okay, I did. No problem. All right. So when I got my package and came out into the car, I was not paying attention. You know, I was waving at her, speaking to her and everything, not paying attention to the street that I went out. I started going down a one-way street the wrong way. I got half a block when I saw all the cars coming towards me and then had to pull off. Okay, there came a street, side street. OK, that I pulled off into when I realized I was going the wrong way. If there had been, OK, just a split second more with a light not stopping, I would not be here today. With the amount of traffic, with the amount of traffic and everything that was there. And that really shook me up because I've never done that before. Never done that before. And so I've been going before God with that saying, who was that woman? Who was that woman that distracted me? And with this week's Torah portion, okay, this week's Torah portion all about being a metzora, all about being unclean, is all about you recognizing your mora your mortality, okay, with regards to, you know, just like just like Solomon says, all right, it's better for you to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Because when you go to a house of mourning, you begin to think about your life. You think about your life. And that just brought so many things, okay, so many things into perspective, okay, for me. Going down that street, I was so shaken. I was so shaken because as long as I have been driving, I have never done that before. 
I have never done that before, you know. So I'm telling everyone, be vigilant, but you'd be surprised how just a little distraction, how even doing good for somebody can wind up messing you up. If you don't know who they are and what their assignment with you is. You understand what I'm saying? Out of all the people that were there, why did this one person come up to me to purchase them a drink? I've just been praising God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me another Passover. Thank you, Lord, for giving me another revelation. Okay, another revelation. Oh, oh and I, I'm just, I'm just totally, just totally amazed, you know, uh, um, at this whole thing. So this is a time of introspection where we need to just reflect upon where it is we are, where it is that we are going. Okay, where it is we are going and who's sending us there. Okay, distractions in our life distractions in our life can bring us into the realm of death. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, I saw that firsthand, firsthand today. So we're going to get started. Uh, we'll get started with prayer. Oh, wait a minute, Lena, you have something? Uh, I had the same experience almost uh, with, with uh, a boiler at our house. Okay. And I'll tell you that later. Okay. The okay. Same thing. Almost. All right. All right. All right. Gave and me so much chaos, I couldn't even think. Mm hmm. So that's it. I'll tell you about it later. Okay. Excellent. 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 And uh, uh, we'll get started with Marcia Austin in prayer. Then, Brad and Jenny, I want to go to you and hear about your concert. I'm still bummed out that I didn't receive the reminder because I was looking forward to going, looking forward to going, you know, but you can tell us, uh, you can tell us all about it and how you spread the gospel. I watched it on YouTube, okay, on YouTube and everything, and it, you did a wonderful job. Those people just, I mean, it was just wonderful, but I'll let you tell it. Marcia, if you could open us up with a power prayer. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Father, we can't even thank you enough, Father, for your watch care, for watching out for us. Oh, God, there is certainly none like you, and we are so grateful, Adonai. Grateful, 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 grateful that we are your children, Father God, and that you love us and care for us, Father God, that you have us in the palm of your hand, Father God, doing all things for us, Father God. Father God, thank you, Father God, for taking care of our pastor, oh God. Thank you for all the prayers that go out before her, Father God. Always, Father God, we, as your people, as we pray for our pastor, we thank you, oh God, for enlightening us, for having her to teach us and to show us, Father God, the path that we need to take, Father God. Father, thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for your goodness, oh God. Lord, we bless your holy name. We praise you and we worship you and we are Lord and I, Father God, we adore you, Father God, and lift you up on high, Father. We praise and worship you, Father God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the Shabbat. Thank you for our freedom from bringing us out, Father God, from captivity, O oh God. Father God, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Israel, Father God. Those of them, Father God, who don't have a place to go, who are crying out to you, Father God, that we, Father God, do hear, and we, Father God, we do pray, Father God, and ask for your goodness, for your mercy, for your loving kindness, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for my brothers and my sisters at the yeshiva, for all of us, Father God. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for holding our hands, Father God, and leading us, Father God, in a way of understanding. Thank you, Father God, for healing us where we need to be healed as we cry out to you that you do hear, Father, and you do answer, Father God. And we are so grateful, Father God, for all that you're doing for your love, Father. Thank you for the Shabbat this day, Father God. Thank you for your goodness, Father God. All I can say, Daddy God, is thank you, thank you, thank you. And I know, Daddy God, we are all thanking you and praising you for your goodness towards us, Father God, that you hear us and you, Father God, leading us in the place that you would have us to go, Father. Thank you for your protection around us, O oh God, for the ministering angels, for our guardian angels, for the Holy Spirit. 
great for all the things that you have provided for us, Father. There's nothing, Father God, that we are lacking, Father God, for you have given us all that we need. So thank you for the word this day, and we give praise and honor. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Okay, Brad and Jenny. Yeah, so I want to quickly just start at the beginning, you know, the, the, the beginning because it's, it's interesting. So about two months ago, I had a invite from a AME uh, church to come out and uh, part the, the, take in their concert. And I've I've worked with the A and E like over the years, so I just you know I assumed it was just a few songs, and you know there'd be other artists there and and stuff, and then you know so that's all fine. Um, and then about two weeks closer to the actual concert, I, I just wanted to reach out to the pastor and and, and come firm with him and everything and uh so i was just wondering how many songs did he you know he expect and he was like oh we're uh we, we want you to do at least five and i'm like oh man five songs you know because <laughs> i you, you you know i haven't you know been as active as i used to be so I'm like, oh man, five songs, but he was like, maybe even more than that. And I'm like, oh man. So, but like, you know how like the enemy is. <laughs> uh, when the enemy knows that you have a plan for God or something that you have to do for God, he'll start planting seeds of like, you know, fear, doubt, and all this other stuff. So the last, you know, Two weeks, I'm sitting there thinking in like my mind, oh, five songs. I was like, how did I wrap myself into this? I said, what have <laughs> what I done to do? So he's hitting me with all this fear and doubt and stuff. I'm like, oh, man. But but at the end of all that, how I, I felt him, you know, impressed to do about eight, eight songs, you know, hater and behind songs. So, you know, I, I'm just like, you know, praying that whole week, you know, the whole last the whole weeks. And uh, so the day of the concert, um, I'm there an hour ahead, right? Because I want to hook up all my stuff, see how it is, see how it sounds, you know. So I got there, hooked it up, everything was all right, everything's found it good so we're like this you know um and then when the concert actually started i was up there i was the first one up there was only two of us to do like you know songs me and this other group so i was the first one up and i and i had my intro as you know pastor it's a same intro um, I, I did at the other one, but on YouTube, they didn't have that on the YouTube clip of me doing like my intro, but I did have that intro. So, you know, after the intro, everything was fine. So I had to play my music to start rapping. The music didn't play. Huh. I don't know what happened. I, I was like, oh, and then I started getting nervous for, for real. So uh, they they had these other uh, uh, you know musicians up there, and they were helping me. They're like, oh, you know, they were working earlier. We swapped out the plug. This they put was the plug. They swapped it out. Nothing. I'm like, oh man, so I'm sweating. I'm sweating because they're all like, <laughs> um, and so I swapped out the player, you know, because I had like some extra like you know players that I had to. The music on me swapped out the flare. It still didn't work. So about 10 minutes of 15, about 15. you know 15 of us trying to see this if this thing will play. I'm like, look what the enemy is you know trying to do. The enemy is trying to stop me. 
But finally, I don't know what happened. Yeah, but it just started playing. And I was like, ooh, thank God for that. So then, you know, you know, music starts. I just started rapping. Um, and I just think that day that it was well, well received. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, you know, because this was an older crowd. I don't even think that there was hardly anybody was, yelling there. There was a few kids. There was a few kids, but it was mainly an older, yeah, older, older audience. Yeah, older audience. But, but they were very receptive. Yeah, so the very receptive, and they, and um, it was just an awesome night. Like, you know, I I felt like after all that stuff that had happened, had the fear and the doubt. And then the music not playing, and then God just handled it though, like at the end, and, and it was received, you know. I, I I give them all the glory, honor, and praise. Um, I'm not too sure, like if there's some other stuff that I'm pissed about how 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 they received uh, it or anything. I mean, this was for their 99th anniversary as well. Wow. So this is why. They had this uh, gospel explosion concert. So what better way than to uh, celebrate with the Torah, right? But, <laughs> That's right. I mean, I went through everything. Like, I went through the, you know, like the dietary laws. Yeah, the I went feast. through the feast of the Lord. I, I was saying Yahweh. I was saying Torah. I was mm -hmm. saying Torah. It was how received. They, they had their ears open and, um, and then even after that, you know, the, you know, the, you know, pastor, he was like, we're going to be working again soon in the future. So, you know, I uh, think they will help me back. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing that, that happened with, you know, you know, pastor is that I, I hit her up on Friday morning uh, because I had us. Uh, you know, how like, hey, you want to rap your 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 song, you know, and and, and like uh, so I hit her up, but I didn't hear from her to you know hear from her the whole day, you know. It's, I thought oh, was like, you know, I know she's busy and and this and that, and I didn't really, you know, I, I was like contemplating have have if I should reach out to you. And, Came and hit you up and yeah, yeah but I was like ah, you know what I don't want to bother her like you know his too far and and blah 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 and uh but yeah so I was just like I didn't even you know say anything but uh but you know what and I think if you would have came it it, it would have really blew off the roof man because uh he he even he even listened he even opened the, the, the door to say because I had has the you know pastor even ahead of Tom about you doing your song he was like yeah 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 sure and he, and then he was like he, even if she wants to if she wants to you know come up and say hey, a few things you know she can hey he just opened the door I was like you know that's <laughs> so, why pastor didn't get the text yeah probably but but next next time I will hit you up, you know, you know, pastor and everyone else who's in the area. But I just felt, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening in my head and, you know, how just, you know, focusing. So, you know, but I gave God all the glory on him. Praise. He, 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 he worked it out and his, uh, you know, glory went forward. So. Amen. Amen. Now, Brad, I don't know if you still have the pictures Okay, the screenshots of your screen and the screenshot I sent you of mine. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm not too sure, but yeah, but I did say it though. Okay, he showed me the screenshot of him sending me the message about the concert. I showed him my phone. I never received it. Yeah, yeah. I never received it. So he had the message of that one and the message afterwards, everything I showed him my screen. I never received it. You you had all my other ones, the ones ahead of that message, the ones after, but that one message in between, you didn't have it on your did phone. Did not receive, did not receive. It was not meant for me to be there that time. 
Yeah. Okay. It wasn't meant for me to be there. Okay. Yeah. That time, you know, next time. Okay. Now see how God operates a lot of times you wait for that open door. Okay. Yeah. Now, you know, the next time you go, that's the time I can go in because the pastor has requested it. Yeah. He's yeah. requested it ahead of time. You see, it was not meant for me to go. Okay. For that particular time. I, oh my gosh. You know, uh, um, God's timing is something else. That's just like on Wednesday, you know, I have my rotary meeting and everything. So, you know, I'm going to the rotary meeting at a red light. I stop, you know, and when you're not supposed to do this, do not follow pastor's example. Okay. So I'm looking at my email and up pops an email. We are so excited about seeing you in your presentation tonight. And it was like, what? <laughs> okay. What? Oh my gosh. Okay. I didn't even have it on my calendar or I, I had it on my calendar, but I thought it was a duplicate for another time. So it was like, oh my goodness, I got to get this presentation together. You know, I can't tell them I'm not coming or anything. And it was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So anyway, got it together and uh, um, it was awesome. But I'm telling you, I mean, God is on the move with a whole lot of things. Expect a whole lot of things, a whole lot of opportunities. Yesterday, I was interviewed by Rotary International Magazine. They're looking at putting our Helping Babies Breathe in the July edition. Okay, July edition of the magazine. Doors are opening, guys. You understand what I'm saying? Doors are opening. Be ready to go through the open door. Okay, the open door. You know, uh, we have a lot to go through today. I have after that, you know, I'll say near-death experience. Let me tell you something. All right. Uh, Jenny, you lost your father around the same time, okay, that I lost Dorian. They were just, uh, you know, just a, a little bit apart. And you remember a couple of weeks ago how I said, you know, like, you know, yes, I lost Dorian, but the person who passes away loses everything. They lose everyone. They lose everyone they love. They not only lose everyone they love, they lose all of their hopes and dreams for everyone that they love. They lose the pleasure of seeing, you know, the potential that they knew that everyone could have. They lose everything. And I was thinking about that, you know, this morning. And I said, you know, I cannot dishonor my daughter's memory by not living and doing the things she knew I was capable of doing. She may not be here to see them. Your father may not be here to see the greatness, okay, of that you and Brad have together, Jenny. But you are here. You understand what I'm saying? You are here to live every single moment to honor the memory, to honor all of those talks that you used to have and the things that they saw, you know, in you. We are here to honor that. So I have to, I have to do certain things because I know that's what she would have wanted me to do. That's what your father would have wanted you to do. Those are the things he wanted to see, you know, in our lives to do. So, you know, I just felt such of a, a um, it was just like a recharge to go forward and to live the life that I know my daughter would have wanted me to live, to live the life your father would have wanted you to have, the joy that he wanted you to have, you know, not the stress and the anxiety and the things that we go through, the fears that we go through, because it is frightening, especially when you know your father loved you unconditionally without condition. That's the way Dorian felt about me, unconditional love. And it was like, you know, when she passed God, you know, you know, this person loved me without condition. There is nothing she would have not done for me. There's nothing your father, if you, if you grunted, your father would have said, okay, what's wrong? He would have pulled up everything, you know, heaven and earth, called out the national guard. Okay, to go see what was wrong. 
And so when we miss that in our lives, it's just like such of a big hole. But then I begin thinking, how do I fill that hole? I fill that hole with doing the things that she would have wanted me to do, to say, to bring her along with me while I am doing them because she would have been there with me when I was doing them. So we go back and to think about those things. If this person was still here, what would we be doing? And do it. You understand? And do it. What were those things that your father was proud of you for doing? What were those things that Dorian was proud of me for doing? Okay, we get, have to think of those things. And those are the things we continue to do. You understand? The enemy will try to take that away from you because when they take that away from you, it's almost like taking away the memory of that person. No, I will not dishonor her memory by not doing and going forward with the life that she knew I was capable of having that we would have shared together if she were here right now. You know, so be comforted in that. Okay, be comforted in that. The things that you did with that concert, you know, would have been so proud. Your father would have been. So he was, a, you and Brad were a source of pride to him, a source of pride and joy. And now you have the opportunity to go and share that pride and joy with others, okay, with others. Because when you go, you are representing him and know that you are living the life that he would have had you to live and the pride that he would have while you were doing that, he will still experience, he's still experiencing that. So, you know, we move forward, okay? We may have lost some loved ones that we did love, but we move forward, okay, with the things that we would have done if they were still here. We move forward, we go forward, okay, with what it is that we are doing in honor of the memory of those who we love. Hallelujah. All right, enough, enough, enough. Let's move forward. I don't have the schedule out. So who is next? Connie. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, Lord. Uh, that, um, you was talking about stuff like that. And I was just thinking about because yesterday was my mom's birthday. Hallelujah. Yes. And I know she would be happy. Yes, she, she would. She loved this tournament right here. <laughs> <laughs> and to know we got married. Oh, my goodness. So yes, do what makes her proud. Take her with you wherever you go. <laughs> okay, I just lost where I was, Lord have mercy. Okay, it's Connie from Tampa. I'm reading Matthew 9, 20 through 26. And behold, a woman with, which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may touch his garment, I shall be made whole. But Yeshua turned him, turned him about. And when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good for comfort. Thy faith have made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Yeshua came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, give place. For the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people went, were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand and made, and the maid arose. And the fame of went on abroad into all the land. For me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Shabbat Shalom. I'll be reading from Matthew 16. 13 through uh, 19 from the uh, Messianic Jewish Family Bible. <clears throat> when Yeshua came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answered, some say John the Immerser, others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He said, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, 
You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Yeshua said to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my community, and the gates of Sheol will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, so that whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden in heaven, and what you permit on earth will have been permitted in heaven. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This is Boise from North Carolina. And I, I thank you, Pastor, because what you said is powerful because we've been on the attacks, too. We've been on the attack, but like I told my wife, it doesn't matter. You lost. We won. So I appreciate that message because uh, the most high just confirmed it to you, Pastor. The attack is on, but guess what? The enemy lost. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, beginning with Matthew uh, the, chapter 16, verses 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Yeshua Mashiach. From that time forth began Yeshua to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Hallelujah. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Adonai, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of Elohim, but those that be of men. Then Yeshua said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life and shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the son of man shall come into glory of his father with, with his angels and to the, and then forgive me and then he shall reward every man according to his works verily I say unto you there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the son of man coming in his kingdom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom this is Katrina from North Carolina I'll be reading uh, Matthew 20, 17 through 19, and Yeshua is going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples apart into the way and said unto them, behold, we go to Jerusalem. Oh, my, my, yeah, that's right. Praise y'all. Um, behold, we go into Jerusalem. The son of man shall be betrayed unto the chief of priests and to the scribes. And they say, condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock him to scourge and to crucify him the third day he shall rise again hallelujah shabbat shalom um miss grace yes <laughs> i'll be reading mark 5 25 through 34 and a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and has suffered many things of many physicians, and has spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Yeshua, came in and pressed behind and touched his garment, for she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Yeshua immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? 
And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith had made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy play. Shabbat Shalom. Miriam. This is Miriam from Spring Hill, Florida. I'll be reading Luke chapter eight, verses 43 to 48. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent of all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stenched. And Yeshua said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter said, they were with him, said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Yeshua said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And said he unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith had made thee whole. Go in peace. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. This is Renee from North Carolina. We'll be coming from 2 Kings, the seventh chapter, verses 1 through 20. And it reads, And Elijah replied, Hear the word of Yahweh. Thus saith Yahweh, This time tomorrow, a sea of choice flour shall sail for a shekel at the gate of Samaria, and two seas of barley for a shekel. The aide on whose arm the king was leaning spoke up and said to the man of Elohim, even if Yahweh were to make windows in the sky, could this come to pass? And he retorted, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. There were four men, lepers, outside the gate. They said to one another, why should we sit here waiting for death? If we decide to go into the town with what with the famine in the town, we shall die there. And if we just sit here, still we die. Come, let us desert to the Armenians camp. If they let us live, we shall live. And if they put us to death, we shall but die. They set out at twilight for the Armenian camp. But when they came to the edge of the Armenian camp, there was no one there. For Adonai had caused the Armenian camp to hear a sound of chariots, a sound of horses, the din of a huge army. They said to one another, the king of Israel must have hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Mitzrayim to attack us. And they fled headlong into the twilight, abandoning their tents and horses and asses, the entire camp just as it was as they fled for their lives. When those lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into one of the tents and ate and drank chicken wings. No, that ain't there, y'all. That ain't there. That ain't there. And then they carried off silver and gold and clothing from there and buried it. They came back and went into another tent, and they carried off what was there and buried it. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping silent. If we wait until the light of the morning, we shall incur guilt. Come, let us go. Let us go and inform the king's palace. They went and called out to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, 
We have been to the Armenian camp. There is not a soul there, not any human sound, but the horses are tethered and the asses are tethered and the tents are undisturbed. The gatekeepers called out and the news was passed unto the king's palace. The king rose in the night and said to his courtiers, I will tell you what the Armenians have done to us. They know that we are starving. So they have gone out of camp and hidden in the fields thinking when they come out of the town, we will take them alive and get into the town. But one of the courtiers spoke up. Let a few of the remaining horses that are still here be taken. They are like those that are left here of the whole multitude of Israel. Out of the whole multitude of Israel, they have perished. And let us sin and find out. They took two teams of horses and the king sent them after the Armenian army saying, go and find out. They followed them as far as the Jordan and found the entire road full of clothing and gear, which the Armenian had thrown away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king, the people then went out and plundered the Armenian camp. So a seed of choice flour sold for a shekel and two seeds of barley for a shekel as Yahweh had spoken. Now the king had put the aid on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate and he was trampled to death in the gate by the people just as the man of Elohim had spoken as he had spoken when the king came down to him. For when the man of Elohim said to the king, this time tomorrow, two seeds of barley will sell at the gate of Samaria for a shekel and a seed of choice flour for a shekel. His aide answered the man of Elohim and said, even if Yahweh made windows in the sky, could this come to pass? And he retorted, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. That is exactly what happened to him. The people trampled him to death in the gate. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Now, let me ask you, can you think of a correlating study, a rather a, a story in the Gospels? Can you think of something that Yeshua said that responds to what happened here, in response to what happened here? I want you to think about it for a minute. Think about everything that happened here. The army besieged the city and everything. And up, oh, you're you're muted. If you were going to talk, Renee and Boise, anyone think of it? What was that, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> he said Jerusalem. <laughs> I didn't think you heard me. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. I was thinking Jerusalem trodden down, but I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Okay. that's the part. When right. you see the army. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now remember that's coming off of whom do men say that I am? Yes. Some say you are this one, some say you are that one. Always remember why. Because he did the same miracles. <laughs> Yes. Okay, as Elijah, as Elisha, mm -hmm. he spoke of the new covenant like Jeremiah. Okay, that's why those particular instances. And then he told them, when you see the cities encompassed, yes. all right, you need to leave. Think about this right here. They stayed in the cities and what happened? Next thing you know, they're eating their own kids and everything. Okay, so the people who were believers followed his instruction and we know through history that those that stayed in the city during that time they actually went through they actually went through that yes okay so when you're looking at this okay especially off of this week's okay uh um the brit hadashah reading okay think about going back sometimes we go back to what the torah is saying Sometimes we need to go back to what the prophets are saying also, because the prophets are teaching a lesson from the Torah portion. 
So you got it right. Don't be afraid to uh, 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 speak out. You were right about that. Okay, absolutely right about that. All right, who do we have next? Shabbat Shalom. Uh, prayer for today, April 20th. Take possession of the gate of the enemy. <clears throat> because my servant Abraham was willing to serve me wholeheartedly, even to, to the sacrifice of his own son, I established my covenant with him and his descendants for eternity. And I promise that his descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. This promise is for you and for your descendants. Serve me with your whole heart, and I will plant your seed in all the nations of the earth. And you and your descendants will possess the gates of their enemies. You will use the battering ram of my holiness to destroy the gates of the enemy and to overthrow the kingdoms of darkness. The gates of hell will have no power to prevail against my servants, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of earth. Through your son, Yeshua, let us possess the gate of the enemy. We release battering rams against the gates of hell, and they shall not prevail against us. Open to us the gates of righteousness that we may enter in. Let the gates of our lives and city be open to the King of glory. Amen. <clears throat> April 21st. My Holy Spirit will repair the broken gates of your life. Raise your praises to me, for I have strengthened the bars of your gates and made peace in your borders. Through my spirit, I have made the crooked places straight and broken the enemy's bars of iron from your life. I have opened the double doors of your gates so they will not be shut against me. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am your God. I will establish the gates of praise in your life and open the gates of righteousness that you may enter in. Holy Spirit, establish the gates of praise in our lives, repair the broken gates of our lives, and open them before us that we may go in and receive the treasure of the hidden riches of your secret places. Let all the gates of our lives and city be repaired through you, and break the gates of brass and iron that the enemy has used to try to hold us captive. Open the double doors of your righteousness in our lives so that the gates will not be shut. Amen. Shabbat shalom, everybody. I'll be reading portion summary through Nisan 9. Portion summary. The 20th, 28th reading from the Torah is called Matzora, a word that means leper. The word appears in the second verse of the reading, which says, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Leviticus 14, verses 2. Leviticus 14 spells out the complex purification rituals for the cleansing of a leper and the leprous home. Leviticus 15 briefly covers the law regarding ritual unfitness stemming from bodily emissions. Except in biblical calendar leap years, Mechzora is read together with the previous Torah portion. So Zaria on the same Sabbath. This week in Bible history, Jews prepared to enter Canaan, Nisan 7, 1273 BCE. The Jewish nation mourned for 30 days following the passing of Moses. During this time, Joshua, the new leader of the Jewish nation, sent scouts to spy on the land of Canaan. See Jewish history for the 5th of Nisan. On the 7th of Nisan, the first day after the mourning period came to an end, Joshua instructed the Jews to stock up on provisions and prepare themselves to cross the Jordan River and began the conquest of the Promised Land. This was the first time Joshua addressed the nation and they unconditionally accepted him as their new leader. <clears throat> War of Egyptian Firstborn, Nisan 8, 1313 BCE. On the Sabbath before the Exodus, Nisan 10, 
on that year the firstborn of Egypt, who occupied the senior citizen in the priesthood and government, fought a bloody battle with Pharaoh's troops. In an effort to secure the release of the Israelites and prevent the plague of the firstborn. This great miracle is commemorated each year on the Sabbath before Passover, which is therefore called Sabbath Haggadah, the Great Sabbath. This is one of the rare incidents in, in which a commemor excuse me, commemorative date in the Jewish calendar is set by the day of the week rather than the day of the month. <clears throat> Feast ended in Shushan, Nisan 8, 366 BCE. The grand 180-day feast hosted by King Agavarosh came to an end on this day. Agavarosh miscalculated the start date of Jeremiah's prophecy which promised the rebuilding of the Holy Temple after 70, 70 years of Babylonian exile, when according to his calculation, the 70 years had passed and the Jews were not redeemed. He orchestrated this grand party to celebrate the demise of the chosen nation. During the course of the party, he brazenly displayed many of the <coughs> vessels looted from the holy temple by the Babylonian army. Seven-day feast began Nisan 9, 366 BCE. Following his 180-day feast for all his international subjects, which ended a day earlier, King Akavarosh began a seven-day feast for his subjects living in Shushan, his capital. This feast ended with the death of his, his queen, Vashti. Sherry. Shabbat Shalom. This is Sherry from Newport Ritchie. I'm going to read uh, Nisan 10 through Nisan 12. Miriam's passing, Nisan 10, 1274 BCE. Miriam, the sister of Moses, passed away at the age of 126 on the 10th of Nisan of the year 2487 from creation 1274 BCE. 39 years after the Exodus and exactly one year before the children of Israel entered the Holy Land, it is in difference to the surpassing that the great Shabbat is commemorated on the Shabbat before the Passover rather than the calendar date of the miracle's occurrence, Nisan 10. Israelites crossed Jordan. Sorry. Sorry. Nisan, uh, Israelites crossed Jordan. Three days after the two spies dispatched by Joshua scouted the city of Jericho, see entry Nisan 7 above, the children of Israel were ready to enter the land promised by God to their ancestors as for their inter as their internal heritage. As they approached the Jordan with the holy ark carried by the Kohanim, the priests, in their lead, the river parted for them as the waters of the Red Sea had split when their fathers and mothers marched out of Egypt 40 years earlier. Joshua 4. Mass circumcision. Nisan 11, 1273 BCE. Following the Jewish nation's crossing of the Jordan into the land of Canaan and in preparation for bringing of the Passover offering, all the men were circum circumcised under the guidance of Joshua. Due to the weather conditions in the desert, which were not conducive for the healing of wounds throughout the 40-year desert sojourn, only the tribe of Levi circumcised their sons. War of Egypt, firstborn, Nisan 12, 1313 BCE. On the Shabbat, before the Exodus, Nisan 10th of that year, the firstborn of Egypt, who occupied the senior positions in the priesthood and government, fought a bloody battle with Pharaoh's troops. In an effort to secure the release of the Israelites and prevent the plague of the firstborn, the great miracle is com commemorated each year on the Shabbat before Passover, which is therefore called Shabbat Haggadol, the Great Shabbat. This is 
one of the rare incidents, instances in which a commemorative date in the Jewish calendar is set by the day of the week rather than the day of the month. Hezekiah Falls, uh, three. Nisan 12, 548 BC. On this day, King Hezekiah, the greatest of all the Judean kings, fell seriously ill and was informed by the prophet Isaiah that he would die, for God was displeased with the fact that Hezekiah had never married. Hezekiah had refused to get married because he had prophetically seen that his children would lead the Jewish people into sin. He erred, for it is man's job to heed the commandment of procreating, and the rest is in the hands of God. Hezekiah asked the prophet to pray on his behalf, but he refused, insisting that the heavenly decree was final. The king asked the prophet to leave, saying that he had a tradition from his ancestors that one should never despair, even if a sharp sword is drawn across one's throat. The king prayed to God and his prayer was accepted. God sent Isaiah to tell him that he would recover and that his life would be extended for 15 years. Hezekiah recovered three days later on the first day of Passover. The king la later married the prophet Isaiah's daughter. Ezra departs Babylon, Nisan 12, 348 BCE. A year following the building of the second temple in Jerusalem, see Jewish, Ezra gathered many of the Jews who had remained in Babylon and began a journey to the land of Israel. Though he certainly wanted to go earlier, his teacher, Baruch ben Neriah, was too frail to travel, and Ezra refused to, relieve, to leave him until his passing. Ezra was the, lead, the head of the Sanhedrin who all traveled together with him. On the 12th of Nisan, Ezra departed from the river of Ahava, the beginning of the long journey to the land of Israel, which would last for nearly five months. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This is Ed in Tampa. What's plaguing your house? Zaretta house is one of three types of plagues mentioned in Parashat of Tezria and Mitzor. The, there are plagues of the body, various types of which are listed in Parashat Tazria, plagues on clothing, and plagues on houses. Let's give a brief recap. A Metzor is a person who has Zaret. This person is impure and has to leave the camp or the city and wait there until the Zaret goes away. When the Kohen visits him outside of the camp and sees that he no longer has Zaret, he does a special procedure with two birds, spring water, a cedar stick, a strip of red wool, and a bundle of herb of hyssop. Then the person washes his clothing, shaves his hair, and immerses in a mikvah. He is now purified and may return to the camp. Houses can also be afflicted with Zaret. And again, it is the coin's job to yeah. identify. If he detects Zaret in the walls, he locks up the house and is left alone for seven days. If the Zaret then disappears, the house is fine. But if nothing happens or if the Zaret has spread, the afflicted stones are removed and replaced, the walls are replastered, and the house is locked up for another seven days. If after the second week the Kohen sees that the Zaret has spread, he declares the house to May and is burned and destroyed. That's the Metzara Roundup from Kabad uh, Ord. Despite the similarities between plagues on the body and on the clothes, the plagues on the house are unique. A, the plagues that afflict the person or his clothing are covered in Parsha Tezria. And then Parsha Metzora begins with discussion of the process of ritual purification for a person who is a Metzora, that is, someone struck with Zaret. Only afterwards did the Torah introduce the plagues that affect houses. In other words, plagues of the houses are separated in the text from other sort of plagues. B, concerning all the plagues we read, if there be, in the skin of a person's flesh, if there be the plague of Zerah in a person, if there be a plague in a man or a woman, if there be upon the garment. When it comes to Zerah of the house, the Torah introduces the law in a unique fashion. And it says, and I placed the plague of Zerah. That means God himself placed the plague of Zerah. C, it is only relation to Zerah on the house that mention is made of coming to the land. When you come to the land of Canaan and I 
Place the plague of Zerat upon a house in the land of your possession. In the process of purification of Mesra, the Torah addresses the situation in the desert. We are told outside of the camp, he shall dwell outside its tent. Before God at the entrance of the oil, Moed. In the process of purification of the house, we read about the house rather than a tent and outside of the city instead of outside of the camp. The portion describing the plague upon the house is introduced with the words, when you come into the land of Canaan, which you should have bought, which you should have bought to mind. The caution against disobedience found in Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 12. In other words, you should have remembered where it says in Deuteronomy 16 to 12. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall leave and have bought thee into the land which he swore to thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, and to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou builtest not, and the houses full of good things, which thou fillest not, and wells dig, which thou dig, diggest not, and vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not, when thou should have eaten in full. Verse 12, then beware, lest I forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. This teaches us, or should teach us, that Zaret affecting your house is in contrast to other types of plagues, occurs only in Itzrat Israel, the Holy Land itself. Some commentaries deduce from Rambam's word that all of the plagues occur only in Itzrat Israel, but this is a minority view. It may be for this reason that Zaret of the house is treated separately and differently from that of the body and garments. The Torah begins with the discussion of Zaret of the body, and of garments, both of which were relevant already in the desert, and then goes on to describe the process of purification of Metzra. Only afterwards, it mentions made of Zaret that affects the house, since it is not yet relevant, but may appear only in the future when the nation enters into the land. Why does Zaret of the house occur only in Israel? Israel? By studying the continuation of the parasha, which is the description of the purification process, involved in the Zaret of the house, the sages deduce that the house must be one that is built from stone, wood, and earth, and not a tent. In Sifra, Bara Itta, the Rabbi Yishmael, Parsha 1, chapter 1, it says, and I place the plague of Zaret upon the house in the land of your possession. This refers to a house that is made of stones, wood, and earth, which are able to contract ritual impurities. It is possible that a type of house that is not made of stone, woods, and earth could contract impurity. Maybe we don't know, it is not. For this reason, it is written, he shall break apart the house with its stones, its wood, and all the earth of the house. Thus we learn from the description of the ultimate fate that a house cannot be struck with this ritual impurity unless it is built of stones, wood, and earth. If the plague appears only in the house of stone, then it is clear that it was not relevant in the reality of the tents in which Bena Israel dwelt in the desert. In other words, Zarat of house appears only after entry into the land because there are no permanent houses in the desert. According to this view, there is no fundamental connection between plagues upon the house and Israel, Israel specifically. This answer does admittedly solve some of the questions that we posed above but it gives rise to two difficulties. Firstly, why does Zarah affect specifically a house of stone and not a tent? Secondly, the Torah could have said if there be a plague of Zarah upon a house, it would have been clear that there are no houses in the desert and hence the plague would, appear, would not appear there. But the parasha bears a unique introduction. It makes an explicit note of the entry into the land and the fact that God gave the land to Israel. The first verse sounds like the herald of some auspicious declaration of promise. After the words, when you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you as a possession, we expect some stately continuation and are disappointed at the promise that follows. And it says, and I place a plague of Zarah upon the house of your possession. In this context of the structure and style expression, and I place Vinati Tati as the effect of conveying the sense of something positive that is going to happen. In other types of Zaharat, as noted, the introduction is formulated in conditional terms. If there be a plague of Zaharat upon a person, thus we're faced with the question, what is the connection between Zaharat of the house and entry into the land? Leviticus 14, 23 says, and the Lord spoke to Moses unto Aaron saying, 
when you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession, and I put a plague of leprosy in a house in the land of your possession. The opening verse describes a good land which God had given. A person who understands that God has given him the land its possession, which I gave to you as a possession, is conscious of the fact that the land really belongs to God. He himself has merely received a gift from God, and therefore he does not treat his property as belonging to only himself. He knows that he must share it with others and that the God, that the good God has granted it. In contrast, a person who treats his house as a house of your possession feels like the house belongs solely to himself and therefore is not interested in giving up his possessions to others. In other words, he's stingy. He wants it all for himself. This is the person's mistake. The property in the house are not his. They are a gift from God. If his sense of ownership of the property expands to the point where he's not prepared to give any of it to others, then I shall place a plague on Zarat upon the house of your possession. The plague will come reminding him that the house is not really his own possession, but rather something granted to him by God. This person has forgotten that God is the true owner of the property, that he's given him everything. He holds on his property because it's so tight that he was not prepared to share anything of it with anyone. The plague that appears on the house is not regular mold and cannot be treated in natural ways. According to our JPS the not commentary on Leviticus 14, 33, 35, it states it in this way, mildew or rot in the walls of a house. Since the condition resembles our rat in humans, it was believed to be a manifestation of the same deadly leakage of life. Greenish or reddish streaks deep into the walls are deemed on site to be Zaret. However, it is a special plague sent by God. This plague is to, remit, to remind the person who the true owner of the house is. Only if the person mends his ways will his house be healed. The healing process may be relatively short. The objects are removed from it. It is sealed up for seven days and the specific stones that are affected are removed and new stones are put in its place. But if the person has not repented and the plague once again erupts on his house, the entire house must be taken apart. The removal of objects from the house teaches the person that his property is not entirely his own possession. If this step does not have the effect of causing him to repent, the plague attacks the house once again. Then it is dismantled. Taking the house apart is a more drastic step. It teaches him that this type of house is not worthy of being inhabited. Only when a person recognizes the true house owner is this house worthy of being lived in. Now we understand why Zara appears specifically on a house of stone. The reason would appear to be that this type of house, there's a greater chance of a person having a sense of absolute ownership and forgetting that the house would exhibit him to a possession by God, as the Torah describes. Guard yourself, lest you forget the Lord your God. Lest you eat and be satisfied and build houses, good houses, and dwell in them. And your cattle and your sheep multiply, and you have much silver and gold, and all that you have is abundant, and your heart becomes haughty, and you forget the Lord your God. That's Deuteronomy 8, 11 to 14. Also Deuteronomy 11, 11 to 12. But the land which I go to possess is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh the water of rain from the heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year and even to the end of the year. So that land that is good and full of milk and honey is a land that God looks at all the time. The person has erred and haven't forgotten that his house has actually belonged to God. By the means of Zaret and the process of purification, the person undergoes a significant process of interchange, hopefully. The dismantling of one's house is a significant psychological experience. Everything that the person has is broken up. The things that were so secure in his eyes and over which he felt such secure ownership is taken apart. When he's left with nothing of his own, he understands that the true owner of the house is God. When he lives with the sense that everything belongs to God, then he may receive the additional gifts from God, that is treasure buried and hidden under the house. Zarat of the house is a punishment. The Tarot teaches us that Zarat of the house is punishment for certain sins for those who want to lend objects in their homes and those who steal or are miserly. In this case, are miserly. 
In this case, the punishment is especially fitting as part of the cure. If a person refuses to lend objects to their neighbors with excuses that they do not own such an object, their life is revealed after they were forced to remove all their belongings and arrange them outside after the arrival of the priest. If they have stolen or refrained from returning a borrowed object, this will be revealed in the same manner. In other words, everyone gets to see what's in your house. The Rambam teaches that desire of the house is the first step in a chain of gradually intensifying punishment for speaking slander. This affliction comes as a result of sin. This is hinted by the prophet Habakkuk. You have plotted shame for your own house and guilt for yourself, for a stone shall cry out from the wall, and the rafter shall answer it from the woodwork. Ah, you have built a town with crime and established a city with infamy. Habakkuk 2, 10 to 12. Zarat is a melody, only affects homes in the land of Israel and only homes built of stone and wood. To Zarat, the body did afflict Jews in the desert. Zarat of the home did apply to Jews in the desert as they lived in tents. The commentator explains that houses outside the land of Israel are devoid of special sanctity imparted to the houses in the land of Israel as a result of God's presence, which is manifest in the temple. Therefore, such matters of holiness and purity do not apply outside the land. The idea of the land of Israel having a special sanctity and therefore a higher standard is reflected in Leviticus 18, 28. So let not the land spew you out for defiling it as it spewed out the nations that came before you. What's plaguing your house? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Very good. I'm uh, <laughs> still kind of messed up over this uh, lesson today. Okay. We talked about houses. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, a personal Zerat and everything and uh, what it actually means. And I want you to just, just think about something for a minute. Our first experience with leprosy, we'll see with Egypt, was what? Can anyone remember? And uh, this will be interactive, so you can, uh, um, if you don't have any background noise going on, you can unmute yourself. What was our first uh, experience with Zerat or uh, leprosy? Moses, right? Moses, yeah. Moses. Mm -hmm. And what was the context of that about? It was to demonstrate God's power uh, to the people, to the Israelite people. In what aspect? Do we remember the lesson about that? What was he showing them? Why did the people respond the way that they did to that leprosy? Remember, you have to go all the way back to what, what, uh, um, what, I'll say Yeshua, what Yahweh said to them, I will see, you know, I will deliver you. I have seen your suffering. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've seen all of that, seen all the things that they did to you. And I'm going to, you know, deliver you. I'm going to save you and all, all of that. What was the one thing that we talked about? The crimes. Remember we talked about crimes? Mm -hmm. Okay, what was one of the biggest crimes that Egypt had done against the people killing the babies in the in the in the Nile okay killing the babies in the Nile um commanding the midwives to do what to abort the birth to kill the babies okay which would have they were to tell the mother that what condition was the baby still born still born still born so our first experience once again with leprosy always remember with these lessons you have to go back where have i seen this before what is god trying to convey to us do you think it is any accident that right after he talks about birth we talk about zarat mm -hmm. all right the two are tied together we talk about a woman giving birth to a child then we get right into leprosy again there seems to be that correlation with leprosy and birth a stillbirth okay a, a stillbirth and, and let's think about it when 
Later on, when we see in Numbers, the incident with Miriam, okay, Aaron and Moses, and God strikes Miriam with leprosy, does anyone remember what Aaron cried out? Don't let her be as if she's stillborn, dead. Right, right. Don't let her in particular, okay? Do not let her be like one dead who emerges from his mother's womb with half his flesh eaten away. All right? That's Numbers uh, 12, 12. All right. So leprosy... Uh, talking about stillbirth being, you know, uh, a, a form of death, in other words. What is all of that bringing us back to? And I want you to think about it. When you think about the purification, okay, the purification of the leper, what components do you need? I'm getting ahead of myself in this, but I have things I want you to think about. All right. So you need what? Wood, you need hyssop, you need uh, blood, you need water. And? Uh, what's the other? I'm leaving out one. A lamb. A lamb. A lamb, right. Where have we seen those components before? Passover. Ah, come on. Mm -hmm. Okay, Passover. Passover is where we became what? A community. Mm -hmm. One, where we were born. Remember, we have the blood on the doorpost. We're commanded to stay behind the blood until the morning. And then we rush out of that door, okay, through the blood as if one who is what? Born. born. Very good. Some of you are forgetting your lessons. Okay. One who is born. So it is through Passover that we were what? Born into a community. Born into one people, right? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you something. When you are a leper and uh, you have to get put out of the community, I want you to think about it. You're no longer part of the people again. You're no longer part of the community. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I want you to think about it. How do you get back into the community again? Mm -hmm. Whereas Passover in Egypt was about the community as a whole. Okay. Being made a community as a whole. I want you to think about the purification process of a leper as what? I'm getting back into the community again. Mm -hmm. I now have to do what? This is my personal Passover back into the community again. Yes. Same elements of the original Passover are the same elements elements of someone who has been kicked out of the community the things they need to do to get back into the community again now after they came out of the community where were they taken to outside not the king okay no after after they came out of egypt okay where were they taken to mount sinai, mount sinai. What did Mount Sinai look like? What was it surrounded by? It was fire or smoke. Fire or smoke and what else? Rumblings. What else? Cloud? Ah, okay. A cloud. What is a cloud made of? Water. Water. What did they have to go up through? Water. Water, okay? All right. You have to get the picture of what is going on here. All right. So a leper, one who has been a leper, okay, gets kicked out of the community. All right. In order for him to be restored into the community, 
He has to go back through the very steps that made the community again. Can we all agree with that? Mm -hmm. So if the Passover and what happened in Egypt on that night going through the door was a type of birth, what does the leper have to be to reborn. come back to the community? Or reborn. Or born again. Born again. Born again. Born again. Okay, born again. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Born again. Born of the water, born of the spirit. And what else did we have to have? Uh, a lamb. A lamb. Okay, a lamb. All right, so I'm just going to leave you with those thoughts for a minute. Eventually, you're going to get it. Okay, so now, there are two consequences of becoming unclean when you are to my unclean. Number one, person who is unclean or to my must leave the camp, okay? In fact, I want you to think about it. Our next, uh, okay, a book is Numbers. Numbers chapter five, verses one through four. There comes a time when God will instruct you to put some people out the camp. Hello. All right. So, you know, there comes a time when God no longer plays with our uncleanness. All right. Because what does that have the ability to do? Thank you whole group that's right the whole, group. whole group what did paul teach a little bit of leaven does what leaven it leaven the whole, the whole lump. lump all right so two consequences number one you get put out the camp number two there are different kinds of purification rituals regarding a type of mikvah and an offering all depending upon what the degree of severity for your uncleanness. Now, one thing that, that really, really struck me coming out of, I think it was Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus chapter 15, Exodus, Leviticus, come on now. Leviticus chapter 15, verse number 31. You shall put the Israelites on guard against their uncleanness, lest they die through their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle, which is among them. In other words, you've got to warn the Israelites, okay, that their uncleanness can lead to their death. Okay, can lead to their death. Okay. So he says, and I want you to think about this. Now we know the tabernacle, the Mishkan, is no longer in the midst of the people. However, is it really gone? Where is the tabernacle today? We are. We are the tabernacle. We are the tabernacle. What does he say in 1 Corinthians? Okay, verse three, I'm, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter three, verses 16 and 17. Ye are the temple of God. And whosoever defiles the temple, him will I destroy. Do you think understanding the laws about clean and unclean, what can defile and what is not defiling are important to us today? Yes. yes, they are. Okay, this is one reason why it is important to teach the tabernacle ordinances. The tabernacle ordinances. So if it was not important, why is Paul reminding the Corinthians of that? 
You of see course. how the church will tell you all of that has been done away with? Uh, yeah. But they have no concept when it comes to that Paul is teaching the Torah to the Gentiles. Yeah. All right. Yes, there is a time when there will not be a physical mishkan the way or a temple the way that there is now. However, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, there are certain ordinances that you have to obey. All right. The consequences of being unclean is that we see here, you cannot enter the tabernacle or the innermost part of the camp where the tabernacle was, all right? That area would not even tolerate those who were unclean, all right? In order for you to enter that tabernacle space, there were certain purification rituals that had to be done. Now, if it had to be done for the priest to enter in, how much more for someone who was undergoing leprosy or something like that? Okay, think about it. This is why I say it is God that determines what is holy, not man. How many times have we gone into church? This is a holy place. We were told that place is holy. Mm -hmm. If it were as holy as people said it was, you would see ambulances and everything out there every single, there would not be enough room at the coroner's office <laughs> okay, for mm -hmm. people just marching in any old way where the mm -hmm. presence of God is. Mm -hmm. oh, mercy. Man does not determine what is holy. God determines what is holy. If you want to determine what is holy, then you are saying, I am above God or I have become God. Understand that. Yeah. All right. So being to my, okay, now understand something. Being to my or unclean is not sin within itself. Okay. And think about it. Is giving birth to a baby sin? No. No. Is a woman having her cycle sin? No. No. Is men having a, a night admission or something like that sin? No. No, it is not. Okay. That only shows we are what? Human. Mm -hmm. That we are simply human. Okay. And so it's how you handle those areas of uncleanness that can make it into sin. God says, he gives us certain purification rites. Just follow this. You're going to be okay. But what happens if we say we're not going to do it? We're going to do it our way. Mm -hmm. Okay? Not good. It's not good. Mm -hmm. Not good at all. Okay? Now, I want you to think about it. All of these things, uncleanness, reveals to us that we are mortal, right? Remember what he said to Adam and Eve, or rather to Adam, if you eat of this tree, ye shall die. They ate of it, guess what? They didn't die right away, but they traded living forever for what? Mortality. So our uncleanness reminds us that we are what? Mortal, that we are not God. Okay, death causes the highest level of uncleanness is that of a corpse. The second level highest uncleanness is that of a leper. Remind that because with both of them, if you go, if a corpse goes into a room, everything in that room becomes unclean. If a leper goes into a room, Everything in that room becomes unclean. So while a leper is alive, he's the walking dead. That's what a zombie is. A leper is like a zombie, the walking dead. All right? And I want you to think about this. Death is the punishment for those who improperly handle their uncleanness. Mm -hmm. I want you to think even about Nadab and Abihu, who took the 
okay, the, uh, uh, what? Took some strange fire, took that incense, and we're going to just march right on in to the holiest of holies. What happened to them? Except. <laughs> Except. Because there is a way to approach God, and there is a way not to approach God. You, we do not approach God on our terms. Yes, we can boldly go before the throne of grace now, right? Isn't that what the word says? Isn't that what the church would tell you? Yes. All those ordinances are done away. We can go boldly through the throne of grace. Yeah, but guess what? You still got to go through the blood of a lamb. Yes. Oh, and that lamb is Yeshua HaMashiach. You can't just go walking up into God's house declaring anything. You must come through the blood of a lamb. All right. Let me tell you something. You know what one of the greatest spiritual teachers is? I realize this today. One of the greatest spiritual teachers is death. Yes. What? That's why, okay, Solomon says, it's better for you to go visit the house of someone mourning than the house of a bunch of people partying all the time. A better for you to go to a funeral. Why? Because that's how everybody's going to wind up, okay? And when you see that person in the casket, you're going to take it to heart. That's what he's saying. But what do we typically, this was what bugs me, it's beginning to irritate me even more. We do so much entertaining in the church. Yes. We got ladies day, we got this day, we got that day. Everybody's always partying. Everybody's always trying to feel good and everything. We always go to the house of feasting. There's a time for feasting. There's a time for mourning. Okay, time for mourning. We do more feasting. You want to know why? Because we don't want to have to deal with things. That is our escapism for having to deal with reality. All these conferences wind up being crack, okay, like crack cocaine to the religious. I know somebody's going to get mad at me for saying that, but that's okay. All right. The Bible says death is the end for all men. It reminds us what is important in life. God told Adam not to eat from one particular tree. And we know that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he gave them consequences. What did he say? You shall die. He gave them consequences before they ate. God will tell you what the consequences are before you do that thing. So if you do it, knowing the consequences, why do you call out to God or why do you come to sister so-and-so to pray you out of consequences that you knew were going to happen before you did it? Yeah. Isn't that what usually happens? Mm -hmm. Okay. We know what's right from wrong. All right. Remember, before they ate, they were going to live forever. Mm -hmm. After they ate, they became mortal. You know what mortality is? Mortality makes you susceptible to death. Mm -hmm. Think of it like that, susceptible to death. Okay, so think about it. God gave them one law, that's all. Just one law. And if you keep this, you are acknowledging that I am the source of your life. If you cling to my laws, you are clinging to me. When we cling to his laws, cleave to his laws, we are cleaving to him because he and the word are one. If we cleave to his laws, we are cleaving to him and we are cleaving to life. I want you to think about this. Deuteronomy 4.4, 4, I'm going to go there. Deuteronomy, I'm going to read from the uh, JPS Tanakh. Let me find it here. Deuteronomy 4.4. 4. 
Deuteronomy 4.4 4 says, okay. While you who held fast that cling to Yahweh, your Elohim. Hold on a minute. Let me see if I have this in the, uh, if I still have it up here. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna share screen. Okay. Hold on a minute, I'm having a pro problem with my mouse here. Okay, so I have here that word cling or cleave, Deuteronomy 4.4, 4, but ye that did cleave to Yahweh, your Elohim. Hey, you're alive today. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you are alive, every one of you this day. Next time, okay, Deuteronomy 10.20, you shall fear Yahweh, your Elohim. Him shall you serve and to him shall you cleave and swear by his name. Deuteronomy 11.22, for if you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in his ways and mm -hmm. to to him. So can you see what it is I'm saying? If you, if you are acknowledging him as your source of life, when you cling to his laws, okay, you are cleaving to him and you will live. Deuteronomy, okay, let me read that again, 1122, for, for if ye shall diligently keep these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in all his ways, to cleave to him. What did Yeshua say? If you love me, you will do what? Obey me. Obey my commandments. <laughs> Let's go Deuteronomy 13, 4. Ye shall walk after Yahweh your Elohim and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave to him. Cleave unto him. Okay, so we see that by cleaving to his commandments, we are acknowledging him as the source of our life, as the source of our life. Okay, so he gave us one commandment. Other words, don't eat this, but if you do eat it, what that shows me is that you want to follow your own rules. Mm -hmm. You want to follow your own, own rules. You want to deny that I am the source of your life. So when we deliberately disobey his commandments, it says to him, we want to follow our own rules. We want to be the source of our own life. So guess what God does? He lets us. Yes. <laughs> He lets us. Now, I want everybody to look around at the condition of the world. How's that working out for us? Not good. Okay. It's not working out. It's not working out, okay? Why is there so much death? I want you to think about this. Why is there so much death? And this is an explanation that you can give to people. Why? Because we live in a world that has no problem turning its back to God. Therefore, death is necessary. Let me say that again. Why is there so much death? Because we live in a world that has no problem whatsoever turning its back to God. Therefore, God's mercy Death is necessary. Death is necessary. Okay. Did you ever think about it that way? No, not at all. When someone asks why, why so much death and dying? Because we turn our back on God. 
When we turn our back on God, make up our own commandments, we are saying, God, you are not the source of our life. Mm -hmm. You are not the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. We are the creators. Okay? Who tried that? Mm -hmm. Anyone think of who tried that in the past? Off the car? Yeah, how to work out for him. <laughs> so if we do it, how's it going to work out for us? <laughs> so why do you not think that Hasatan will always try to tempt us to do exactly the same thing he did? Yes. Remember, remember what his position was. He was the what? Covering cherub. Okay, the choir director. The one who what directed the glory of God, who reflected the glory of God. See, there's a difference being a mirror and then being made in the image. Okay, there's a difference. And why did Hasatan tempt man the way that he did? Because man was made in the image of God, with the spirit of God in him. All Hasatan could do was simply be a reflection of God's glory. And when he decided he wanted to follow his own rules and convince others and turn his back on God, he got cast out of heaven. When man decided he was not going to follow God's rules, he was going to make up rules for himself. He was going to be the creator to determine good from evil. What happened to him? He got cast out. When we decide we're not going to follow God's laws and leprosy comes upon us, what happens to us eventually? Okay. Uh, we get kicked out yeah. of the community. Do you mm -hmm. see the same pattern? It is the same pattern starting from the starting from before the garden to the garden over and over and over again. Satan never has to change his MO because it works exactly the same way every time. When you realize you won't live forever, when you face death, when you begin to accept your own mortality, that's when we begin to cling to the one who is the most high. How many people want you there on their deathbed? Call for the priest, call for the pastor, pray for me. You understand? All of a sudden we realize we're not going to live forever. There is someone higher than us we need to call out to. Death or the promise of death <laughs> is the antidote to our own human arrogance. <laughs> oh, God, help us. All right. All right. Death is the antidote. The antidote to our own human arrogance, yeah. arrogance. When we are faced with death, it begins to put everything in perspective. Our relationship with people, our relationship with God. It was only when we, when things are going really great, okay? We're not thinking about those things. Yeah. When we are faced with sickness and in death, that's when he gets our attention and we start thinking about all the lost opportunities we had for relationships, all the lost opportunities we had to do right, all the lost opportunities that we had to get it right with God. It's only when we're faced with death. Mm. All right. That's why I keep saying death is a servant. We see in Revelation chapter six, Death and the grave have power, are given power over a quarter of the earth. They are servants of God. Yeah. Servants of God. 
That's why when you prefer the house of feasting, we're not set, we're not sensitive to death. When things are going great, we aren't sensitive to death. And we will begin to disregard things that truly matter. Yeah. When things are going all right. Okay. So that's where to my or uncleanness comes in. It gives us a wake up call. Everything's going great. And all of a sudden we come down with something that, oh my God, doctors don't know what to do with. Am I going to die? What is this? I start looking up, uh, looking up stuff on the internet, start looking at YouTubes, <laughs> trying to self-diagnose, okay, self-medicate and finally have to go to the doctor anyway. Okay. That's when, okay. When that comes in, it's a wake up call for us to get it right. And what does it show us? We are not in control. We are not in control. So that uncleanness, that leprosy, okay? We have to look at the symbolism behind each and every part of that purification process. Once we are declared clean, we've got to do what? Go take a mikvah. What does water represent? This is so powerful. Ooh, clean. 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 Water yeah. represents the living God. Yes. Ooh, yes. God. Glory. Yes. Glory. Hallelujah. Water represents the living God. Remember what he said in Jeremiah 2. You have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, mm. right? There is a symbolism of God in the mikvah. Let's go to Jeremiah. Let me see, chapter 14. Jeremiah chapter 14. Jeremiah 14. You never look at a mikvah the same way again, okay? Mikvah representing the living God. You are immersing yourself in the living God. That's why they say living waters. Okay. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 8. <laughs> okay. Oh, hope of Israel. It's deliverer in time of trouble. That word hope is the word mikvah. 14, 8. The word mikvah. Let me share screen again. I'll go to Jeremiah. J E R 14. Okay, Jeremiah 14, verse number eight. Oh, the hope of Israel, the savior in time of trouble. I'm going to click on tools, go to the interlinear so that we can see. Oh, the hope, that's the word mikvah, mikvah. Oh, okay. Mikvah. Oh, click mm -hmm. on that word, Strong's number 844723, mikvah. Where do we see that? It's hope, ground of hope, things hoped for. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see how it is used. The first time it is used is where? Genesis 1.10. God called the dry land earth and the gathering together, the mikvah of the waters. He called the seas and God saw that it was good. All right. Let's see. Uh, uh, okay. I want to see in okay Jeremiah 14 8 the hope of the hope of Israel okay Jeremiah 17 13 oh Yahweh the mikvah of Israel all that forsake thee shall be ashamed and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken <laughs> Yahweh the fountain of living waters. Yes. Yes. And we go down in the mikvah. Hallelujah. 
in the presence of the living God. Yes. The presence of the living God. God is our mikvah. Hallelujah. Okay. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Born of the water and born of the spirit. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. 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 So we see there that God, Yahweh, Yeshua is our mikvah. Yes, Lord. So when we, when we immerse in a mikvah, we're surrounding ourselves in the living God. It reminds us of God's eternity so that when we come out of the mikvah, we are experiencing a rebirth and are once again connected to the source of life. How we connect ourselves. That's what the difference in the rituals of purification are based upon the severity or the closeness to death. There are some you simply have to wash your hands. There are others that you have to wash your whole body and you have to bring a sacrifice, okay? So those that were the closest to death, the leper, the woman who has given birth, or a male or female with an issue, like the issue of blood or running sores and issues. Those are the ones that were closest to death and those are the most severe. So they require the most severe of the purification. Each of those have to bring an offering, which is when you bring an offering, what are you bringing for yourself? Lamb. <laughs> okay, but what is that lamb? It is a substitute. substitute for yes. Okay, remember that it is a substitution mm -hmm. for who? For you. For us. It's a representative of us. When we bring that offering, we are saying, This should have been me. Should have been me. Should have been me. This should have been me. I am now, after you see that, I am now, I'm bringing this to you, it should have been me. I am now aware that my life belongs to you, God. And that it is you who are the source of my life. That's true. Come on, man. It should have been me. It should have been me who died. When you bring that, you're acknowledging you are not the source. That God is the source. The source of Amen. The more severe the case, also, the longer the wait before the purification process can be completed. Okay? And why? Because during that time, we're supposed to be contemplating how I got here, what it took for me to get here. Mm -hmm. Look at everything I lost while I was here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right. How can I avoid ever getting into this position again? It reminds us, that time reminds us that we are not our own source or God. See, some only require a day. Some require seven days. Mm -hmm. Okay, some require seven days. So the mikvah gives us the opportunity for a spiritual rebirth. The time gives us the opportunity to reflect on our physical life. You got to be born of the water and the spirit. When you, listen, when you are in an unclean state and you ignore the signs of being unclean, and you, okay, are, let me see, you ignore the signs of you being unclean, you are establishing your own standards of morality 
And if you try to stroll up into the tabernacle or the temple, it is like you are saying, this is my house. <laughs> I'm going to do it my way. I'll do whatever I want. You're saying God is not the creator. I am. He is not the eternal. I am. You are not. I am not part of God's system. He is part of mine. Mm. <laughs> when we do those things that we know are going to draw abomination to us that's why he gives that warning and says Moses go tell him you better give them folk a warning <laughs> don't come strolling up in here with their uncleanness you better warn them okay and that's what this is a warning when Adam and Eve chose to live in their illusion, that's what it is, deception, an illusion that they were, okay, that they were in control, that was incompatible with the reality of God. Come on. That was incompatible with the reality of God. We are not... Listen, you need to get that song out your spirit, Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I did it my way. Adam and Satan did it his way. What did it get him? Adam and Eve did it his, their way. What did it get him? Nahab and Abihu did it their way. What did it get him? Ananias and Sapphira did it their way. What did it get him? Each of it wound up in death. And death, eating, now understand something, eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil made them unclean. And as being ritually unclean, they could not stay in the garden. Mm -hmm. Listen, I don't say when you are in a state of being ritually unclean, you cannot maintain the things God gave you when you were clean. Mm. Come on, better think about it. Better think about it. Okay? So I want you to think about it. If eating the tree made them unclean, when you get clean, okay, it brings you back into your original state before sin. It's like being back in the garden again. Being unclean is like after sin, being clean when you take that mikvah and all of that you are back in the garden it's like being back in the garden so the ritual of purification is to restore us to what our natural state was before sin okay being clean or tahor means that we have the ability and the potential to once again Live in the garden of God. That's why the enemy always tries to keep us defiled. He wants to keep us out of the garden. Okay. To my and sin, being unclean and sin are not the same thing. Sin comes about when we ignore our uncleanness or purposely bring ourselves into a state of uncleanness and purposely disconnect ourselves from God. Now, why do you think the first chapter to deal with this, not chapter 12 of Leviticus, but chapter 11, what you put in your mouth? What you put in your mouth can draw abomination to you. If you don't believe it, go ask Adam and Eve again. Mm -hmm. What you put in your mouth 
according to God can draw abomination towards you and you will not stay in God's holy place okay. with that abomination. Don't okay. fool yourself. Not everything talking in tongues is speaking with the Holy Ghost. Not everybody hollering from Jesus is saved because even the devils believe True. and even the devils believe and have power. Don't fool yourself now. Come on. Okay. When we deliberately commit sin, we are choosing our own morality over God's. We're saying we are the eternal being, not God. That is why death is the only solution. The only solution. Purification, once again, represents what? Water, the lamb, hiss up. What did we put? How did we put that blood on the sides of the door? Hiss up. Hiss up. What do we need to use for our purification? Hiss up. Hiss up. Blood, a lamb, and water. Okay? And like I said, where have we seen all those components before? At Pesach. Pesach is where we became one community. Being a leper or a metzora is where we get put out of the community or cut off from the community. So in order to come back into the community, we've got to be restored the same way we were in the community to begin with. The blood of a lamb, hyssop, and water. Okay? A metzora or a leper is not just like someone who has died, but it's almost like, just like he said, okay, don't let them be like, don't let my sister be like someone who came out the womb already dead. When you are uh, in a Metsora state, you are like someone who never made it out the womb alive. You are like a stillborn. And that brings us right back to Egypt once again. It's all about Egypt. Leprosy is a reminder of our experience in Egypt. When we break out of leprosy, he's bringing us back. That's why he says later on, I will bring back the diseases of Egypt to remind you where you were, how you came out, and where it is you're supposed to be. <laughs> okay? Remember what happened in Egypt, the death of the firstborn. We are the firstborn. Remember in Egypt, the firstborn of Egypt died, but the firstborn of Israel were dedicated to God. When, you, when we forget who we are, he'll bring us back through Egypt once again through the Pesach, only this time a personal Pesach. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We still need the blood of a lamb and water. Lamb, hyssop, blood, and water. Water representing the living God, representing that cloud around Mount Sinai. So it's always been all about Egypt all about Egypt. Don't forget who we are because when we forget who we are, he has a way of reminding us. That's why sometimes we will break out with certain things because we've forgotten the fountain of living waters. We decided we wanted to do it our way and not his way. Let me tell you something. How are you going to know a Passover that God will pass over unless you are faced with the possibility of death. Hey, God, hallelujah. How 
you're going to know I will pass over you and not let the death angel come into your dwelling. How are you going to know him as the Passover if you are not faced with a death and life situation? So we are coming into the Passover. Okay. We've come into the Passover through our personal Passover when we were born again. That is why we're in the synagogue on the Sabbath day where Moses is read. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So that we learn these things. Every time we, as a Gentile, when we first confess to God, they threw us in water, right? Mm -hmm. We had the blood of the lamb. We had the water, which is the what, fountain of the living God. And we entered into the community. And that's what Paul was teaching in Ephesians second chapter. Go to, I'm going to end with Ephesians second chapter. I didn't realize how late it was. Please forgive me, guys. <laughs> Ephesians second chapter, starting at verse number 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Yeshua HaMashiach, you who were sometimes far off were made nigh by what? The blood of Christ, the blood of the Lamb. For he is our peace who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity of the Torah, of the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of two one new man making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body made by the cross, having slain the enmity thereof. So we who were Gentiles, when we come through the blood and come through the water, we are joined into that original body. We go through that original Passover. He brings us to Mount Sinai and joins us into one body. It was always meant to be one. That's why you will see centuries after the death, burial, and resurrection, we have the polycarps and the polycrats that said we are still doing the Passover along with our brethren the way we were commanded by those original disciples. We have not turned to the right or left and we are not gonna turn to the right or left. We're gonna do it the way God ordained it. Why? Because we've been made one by the blood of the lamb. Each of us has had our, when we got baptized and came to the lamb, we each had our personal Passover, and we're joined into the community of God. We were that mixed multitude that he brought around Mount Sinai. We are that ones that said all that Yahweh has said we will do. We will do. And we become one people once and for all. Amen. All right, Ed, pray us out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we, Father God, we just thank you for this word, Father. We just thank you that your word is new to us. Each time we study your Torah, we learn more and more of your word. We thank you, Father, that we're no longer alien to the commonwealth, Father God. We thank you no longer strangers cut off, Lord, from the promises. Thank you for the message, for the word we brought today. Thank you for this Pesach season, Father, and thank you for helping us to understand 
our journey from Sinai to Mount from out of Egypt to Sinai, how it is repeated in our in the Bible and in our lives. Thank you for the lesson on the mikvah, your water, your holy and cleansing water. Thank you for the word. And as always, God, we pray today for Israel, Lord, once again in war. We pray again for the captives who are still captive. We pray for their freedom. Father, we pray for the whole house of Israel. We pray for all the members, Lord God, and listen to this message tonight, today, Father God. We pray that your word is received. Father, we thank you for the greater understanding as each time we go around in your Torah portion, we learn more and more. Thank you, Father, for helping us and holding us to be obedient to your word. Thank you for making us understandable to us where we might be obedient. Thank you for the pastor for making this word today. We pray for healing for all those who hear this word today. Lord, we pray for breakthrough this year. We pray for Pesach being a new beginning, a new birth for us individually and as a nation. Thank you for this word. Thank you for the message. And thank you for this upcoming Pesach celebration. Bless the word. Bless the messenger. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing this word. We pray for healing for all those who need healing. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen, amen. We are probably going to have about six new guests for Pesach. Okay, Dr. Latortu is uh, bringing um, her brothers and uncles, okay, who have never been to a Seder before. Uh, we do have uh, uh, David, okay, uh, coming. He's one of my rotar Rotary members who is a Jew who's never been to one of our type of Seders before. Okay, Tom is bringing him. Okay, Tom is bringing him. And so I was so unsure. And then he came up to me Wednesday and said, Tom explained everything to me and I'm all right with it. Okay, I'm all right with it. So we go in full force, guys, going full force. Okay, so that he can see. Okay, so that he can just really see. You know, so I'm excited about all of you being here on uh, uh, Monday. We are going to start at 7.15. Okay, try to start at 7.15. Okay, because it is a, a long Seder and I want to get people out, you know, we still have to eat and everything, you know, so I'll try to bring it through uh, quickly as possible. But if we start on time, we can get finished on time. All right. So please try to be here by 715. If you are bringing food, please bring here earlier. Um, we need some uh, drinks and ice. Okay, if someone can, okay, you got that, Ed and Connie? Okay, drinks and ice. We need drinks. Okay, Connie has it. Okay, drinks and ice. Okay, uh, that was the last thing. We'll have uh, um, enough food here. Okay, uh, Chef, once again, is doing the cooking. Okay, we should have brisket. We're going to have salmon. I'm going to make the chicken. Okay, again, and I think uh, uh, Lena's doing lamb. Okay, so... We have, we're going to have a very, very nice meal, um, guys. Uh, uh, okay. I did, I'm doing the masa bar chicken soup. Okay. And uh, the tiramisu. Okay. Masa tiramisu and the uh, harosa and the uh, bone. Okay. 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 Then I will definitely need you here a little early. Because I got to put this uh, Harris set on the Seder plates. Yeah. Okay. okay on the uh, on the Seder plates. Okay, and everything. And uh, I found three bones, so I need uh, at least three more. Yeah, I got, I got a whole bag full. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah, so don't worry about bones. Okay. Okay. Very good then. All right, guys. Uh, um, Ed, a nugget. Uh, a nugget. <laughs> God determines what is holy. If man determines holiness, he places himself above God. And the final point, I don't want to get into it too deep, but water. Water is everywhere from Genesis 1, 2 to the Mikvah to Sinai. It's just water, water, water. Water before creation, before he said, let there be light. There's water, water. So water is just wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right. Um, um, you, when you're talking about accepting our mortality and death is the antidote to our own arrogance. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and we are not in charge. I need to let you know we are not in charge. We belong to God. Amen. And God is the source, source of our strength. Very good. And, and, and purge me with hyssop so I can be whiter than snow. Amen. Like yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank yes. you for the word. 
God bless you. Amen, amen. Hermine. Um, I don't even know. <laughs> I took notes like crazy. <laughs> I, so much I don't even know where to look, you know. Um, but it, it, it was so, I, I'm just so grateful for the understanding of what the Passover is all about. I mean, I really, really was just floored by all of it. Um, I know I understood it before, but I understood it this time like I'd never understood it before. And it just stirs my spirit. It, I, it, I am wordless. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I really I I have pages and pages. I think I took every word you wrote spoke, <laughs> honestly, because it was so rich, it's so deep. And uh the need for doing the Passover to remind us what he did and he is doing in us. He did for us and is doing in us. Now we need to renew this every year, well, every day, really, but renew this every year because you can't fully grasp it all. There's just such wonderful, wonderful depth to it. And uh, like I said, I, I never got it like I got it this time around. So thank you, Pastor, because that was that was an awesome, awesome lesson. <laughs> uh, Hi, my you. life belongs to Yeshua, the source of my life. Bottom, bottom line. Amen. Anything that I would want to do other than that is not worth it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, That's it. That's it. Katrina. Oh, praise Yah. Shabbat shalom to everyone. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. God determines what is holy, not man. Yes. And if Adam and Eve wouldn't have ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They could live forever. I'm like, wow, that is so awesome. Praise me. So, yeah. Leper is like a stillborn. It reminds us of the spirit of Egypt. It reminds us where God took us out and where we're supposed to be at right now. Praise y'all. Thank you. This was awesome, Pastor Ears. I really enjoyed it. Looking forward to seeing y'all in person. <laughs> All right, Aquila. Thank you. Yeah. Shalom, everyone. Oh. I, just oh. want to, I just want to just say how you open my eyes wide with that mikvah uh, explanation. Mm -hmm. You know, from the word hope. <laughs> you know, when we take a mikvah and we ask him to wash us and cleanse us like David did, but even after that, we have hope that we can go on a new person, just renewing every time we yes. take a look for. And praise y'all for that. Uh, you also said what you put in your mouth draws abomination towards you. And you use Adam and Eve as an example. And as a result, you're not staying in God's holy place. That's a powerful thing because people eat unclean all the time and lift up holy hands and do all of that and say, well, hey, God said, just bless it, and I'm good. <laughs> but he said something long before that, thou shalt not. And so that clean and unclean, and that we can get purified through water, the lamb, and the hyssop. Amen. Thank you for that, and I won't say any more. I'll let someone else speak. I had to go out and do a little caregiving, but I got that and got as much as I could. Bless you all. Amen, amen, amen. Sherry. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Wow. So uh, the time of Passover um, just reminds us that we are here by the grace of God. We need to examine our, our holiness and the state of our cleanliness um, from the 
uh, from the teaching today. And um, it reminds us that we're that we were at Mount Sinai. We received the same instructions. We are full members of the community. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Cindy. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, Cindy. It's a wonderful, wonderful lesson, Pastor. Thank you for bringing us back to remembrance of it all, you know, including everything that you spoke on, you know, and stuff. But yes, yeah, sometimes we do, you know, uh, slip. I don't want to say slip away, but <laughs> as you call it, oh, you got raptured <laughs> and stuff. But yes, it do, you know, let you know uh, where the things come in and say, oh, yes, I did, you know, move too far over that way to myself and not calling on him and saying, I need you and you are my source and, and my help and my strength in everything, not one thing, but everything. Congratulations, Brad. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Marcia Austin. Shabbat Shalom again, everyone. Shabbat Shalom, sis. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Israel. Um, what you mentioned, uh, you said uh, people ask this question all the time, which is so true, you know, why is there so much debt? Mm -hmm. And it's a, a good question, you know, um, that they pose, and you can really give that answer, that we live in a world that has no problem turning their backs on God. Right. I, I'm sure Katrina could um, identify, you know, in the hospital, we have so many people coming in that they are sick and they have questions. And that's when people are really humbled and they can really minister if you can, if you could do that, minister to, to so many people. Because there are people get humbled at that time when they're sick. They have questions. They don't want to be alone. So, you know, we actually have a first hand, we see all this daily and people do have questions. So that's that's a good um, a good answer for that question because I do have people asking all that all the time because they deal with so much so much troubles. Mm. I was telling my son, I said every day is people coming in with all kind of issues and you feel so sad, you you know, there's some who would listen to you, some who turn away from you. Um they don't want to be bothered. They just want to die. So you have so much people that you're dealing with. So I, I'm yeah. just grateful for the word that you 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 teach us, because we do have um, answers for those out there who are in need. So thank you. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Um, and tell Daniel I did send an email to um his boss. Okay. Well, she said uh, she had sent it out. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, he right. wanted to check with you on that. Okay, yeah, I'll check. I'll check and let you know. All right. All right. Uh, Brad and Jenny. Um, how is find it interesting and how we go through the certain levels of uncleanliness, like you were, like you were saying last week about the, the dead bodies, the animals, childbirth, you know, all these things that can cause us to be unclean. And then what you have to do, like you know, there's some that all oh, like we're, you know, they were, you know, require one day. And then there's some that take a whole week, um, but it, it's all in there. And it says what you have to do and for how long. So it's very specific on what kind of uncleanliness uh, you encounter and how to handle it. Mm -hmm. But one thing I don't really remember or maybe I forgot it is when you were saying, and even in as repeating where they were saying about the house, it, it was uh they were saying 
that sometimes like you uh the leprosy is more tied onto when they were in in the land and God gave them these homes um you know that there's there was like you know it had a, there were a hearth and like stones mm -hmm. and stuff like that like I don't really think I've ever heard that, that there are certain things that are you know the earth and the stone and that that are more like I guess you know prone or it's more tied to his real kind of land um so that was an interesting uh you know concept that I you know I haven't heard um I mean I don't, I don't know if, if you're able to explain a little bit more about the earth and the stone and, and about the land okay hold on one minute because I understand what you're what you are talking about here okay um that is Leviticus chapter 14. All right. Leviticus chapter 14, verse number 34. When you come into the land of Canaan, which I give to you for a possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in your house of the land of your possession. Number one, as he talks about, remember where they were going. They were going into a land where they didn't have to build the houses. Everything was built for them. Remember what happened in that land prior. Why, why are they there? Because the land spit them out. Okay. Remember what Yahweh tells them later. If you do the same thing those Canaanites did, the land is going to spit you out also. So God puts a plague in the house for a reason. Maybe it could be, and remember, it's him that puts the plague into the house, all right? Could be many different reasons, okay, different reasons why, and also how the house is built. Some houses maybe were built of just wood. Some houses built a combination of wood and stone or whatever. Not all the houses were built the same way, all right? If, say, for example, in some of the examples they give, he might put a plague in the house because, hey, in the wall, they had an idol. So he puts the plague in the house. So you have to do what? I got to move these stones out to cleanse it. And ooh, I moved the stone and there's all these idols, okay, that are behind the wall. So I had to pull them out because what do those idols do? They draw abomination into the house. So mm. you're trying to figure out why stuff is going wrong and all this. I'm living, I'm going, I'm doing this. And here you have all these idols in the house. So he puts the plague on the house for you to take the house apart and see what's going on with it. Now, that's when you are in the land. But think of the concept even over here. When I give you this house that, you know, you didn't have to build it. It's one thing if you build a house, you build the foundation and everything on it. But what about a house you buy from someone else? Yeah. You don't know what went on in that house. Am I right? You don't know what was hidden behind the walls. You don't know if somebody was murdered in that house and they just painted the walls or did whatever. There was abuse or whatever. You don't know. So when I put a plague on the house, it is to inform you of something. You trying to figure all this stuff out. And when I show you this, all of a sudden, it's like, you know, uh, mold breaks out. What is going on here? And I go behind the walls there and it's like, oh my goodness, what is going on behind this house here? And you correct the problem. You understand what I'm saying? So yes, you know, when you get into the land, it's one thing, but I can see the application over here also. Another thing they said, another reason why, say for example, you were talking bad about somebody. Lashon Haram in the house, so leprosy in the house, or you borrowed something and didn't give it back. So now everything in the house has to come out. Your neighbors are gonna see everything and, and the neighbor's gonna see that thing you said you didn't have, okay, in the house, <laughs> okay? 
So God has a way of resolving it. And how does he resolve it? Through leprosy of the house. Okay. However, I want you to think about it. You got all this bad, evil speaking and everything, leprosy upon the house. You don't get it right, leprosy on the clothes. You still don't get it right, leprosy on you. So you see the progression. See, the one thing I wish they did was to put the house first, then the clothes, then the person. But because they kind of did it opposite, you know, the person, then the clothes, then the house, it kind of causes a little confusion as to the progression of things. But you can see he deals with the outward first. Then if you don't get it, he deals with that, which is a little bit closer to you. Then if you still don't get it, he'll deal with you directly. Okay. And then if you still don't get it, you get put out of your house. And by your house, I mean this. <laughs> okay. That's where death comes in. You get put out of your house. Okay. At that time. All right. So the time to get it right was when the leprosy broke out in the house. Things started going on in the house. Okay. That's called mercy. I call that mercy. Okay. Call it mercy. So anyway, Marcia, did you have anything you wanted to say? I saw you unmuted yourself. Okay. Maybe not. Did I explain that? A little bit, Brad, or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's more clear. Yeah, I just wanted a little bit more insight, but yeah, but it hit it. Yeah, you hit it on the heart there. Yes, yes. You know, so <laughs> you use the concept. It's when you get into the land, but that concept can be used in your house, your physical house. Remember what Paul and the greatest thing Paul says: "You are the temple of God. You are the temple of God." So he uses the same temple ordinances. Only this time you are the temple and whoever defiles the temple, him will God destroy. When they defiled the physical temple, what did God do? He allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in and break it down to the ground. So he's saying those same principles, okay, apply to you as a person. When the temple broke out in leprosy, why did the temple break out in leprosy? They were having idols in there. Look at in, in Ezekiel chapter eight and Ezekiel chapter nine. Look at what was going on even during the days of Yeshua. He had to go in there and clean out. They turned his house into a den of thieves, leprosy. You understand what I'm saying? So it's the same concept, the same pattern over and over again. And you can take that concept and you can apply it over here. So when you go and you see something going on, okay, with, with people all right attribute it to that leprosy what is going on that this keeps on happening it keeps on happening in different degrees you can take the, all the mikvahs you want but if there's leprosy in your house every time you walk into that house you get what reinfected again if you keep on doing the same things you're going to have the same results going to keep having the same results, okay, over and over again. Hallelujah. Did, did Jenny just sneeze? No, <laughs> no. no, no it's, it's a tickle in my throat, but if you want it to be a sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyhow. Are, anyone else have any questions? All right. Well, with that, I'm going to go because I have, uh, I wish I could show you, okay, everything out on these tables. Time for me to start putting the table. Oh, go ahead, Lena. Actually, everybody, uh, I enjoyed this one. My, um, my thing is that we just have to learn to approach on God's terms. Yes. A lot of my friends, a lot of people, they say they believe in God, but they don't do what I see them not doing what they read in the Bible. So it's up to us. I mean, not we're not going to be responsible for them, but at least we can say, just read what the God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob said when he, you know, in the Bible and read it. And if you don't understand, come back every week and, you know, have a lesson or something like that. And um, even us, sometimes we don't 
do what we're supposed to be doing. So uh, it's a lesson that you keep pounding on us, and I'm really learning a lot more every every time you teach. So just you know, to have health, to have agility, just do what God tells you to do. Mm -hmm. To eat the right food, to go do the right thing with different people, go teach them what you have already learned. So that's what he wants. That's he loves us because he doesn't want us to go astray from him. Just like right. a shepherd in the field, he you know, he looks over his flock. And then all of a sudden there goes a strain sheep or a goat and he has to go back and pull them back down. So exactly. that's what he's doing to us if we just follow his instructions. Thank you. That's right. That's right. Are you still bringing your guests? Um, um, if you want us to. It's up to you. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll ask her this time she's over at somebody else's house oh okay so she's not with you no okay then no then no okay okay, okay. she doesn't know that you just asked me so uh you know okay she's with libby now poor libby, with libby? okay yeah okay all right we'll talk about it Anyway, yeah. uh, um, anyway, okay, guys, if that's all the questions and everything, uh, go ahead, Hermine. Yeah, um, is there any literature on hyssop? Because I don't know what it is actually. Um, well, you can. Always... I looked it up in the. I looked it up in the Strong's. It's not in there. I know where you can get it. Okay, see Lena. She'll have something for you. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And Brad, give me a call later, so uh, uh, or after this, so we can talk about the sound and everything, and my idea for what we can do. Anyway, all right, guys. Okay, get ready for a wonderful uh, uh, Pesach. Okay, on uh, Monday, and I'll see some of you on uh, tomorrow. Okay, mm -hmm. tomorrow afternoon and everything. So I'm looking forward to that. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Shalom, shalom. All right, guys, take care. Blessings to you. And wait to see you, Katrina. Yay. Yay.